Well, thanks for joining us. My name is Brett, one of the staff people here at New Life. Let's pray together, please. Lord, I thank you for the book of Acts and what it teaches us about your church and how you want to walk with us. Help us to follow in your steps, to be what they, to do what they did so we might be who they were. Uh, through Christ I pray, amen. So recently I shared a story from the beginning of Acts chapter 17. Today I want to continue in Acts chapter 17, one of my favorite uh, chapters in the entire book of Acts. Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul is on his second missionary journey. You might call it his second church planting journey. The first time through, he planted some churches. The second time through, he's encouraging those churches. But now he's extended himself beyond those churches. Last time he was in, in the 16th chapter, he was in Philippi. And he shared the gospel and they started a church, Lydia and some of her household. And then he healed a woman that was demon possessed and that created a stir. And so he was beaten and thrown into jail and God miraculously released them with Paul and Silas with a, um, with an earthquake. The jailer and his family became followers of Christ. They were baptized in the middle of the night. And then the official, officials of the city realized they were in trouble because Paul and Silas were Roman citizens and they'd beaten them and uh-oh, there were problems. So eh, get out of our town before we get in trouble. So the 17th chapter begins as they have made their way out of Philippi. They've made their way to Thessalonica. In Thessalonica, basically the similar thing happened, except he first goes to the synagogue, teaches about Jesus for a few weeks. And then people are starting to come to Christ that some believe, some don't believe. Those who don't believe begin to persecute those that do believe. A big stink is raised. Those who are, uh, Jason, who's keeping Paul and Silas and Timothy, is dragged out in front of the city officials. Apparently they can't find Paul and Timothy and Silas at this point. And so they basically tell, you know, Jason, stop doing this stuff, you know, whatever. And so the word gets to Paul and and Silas and Timothy, and they're like, hey, you probably better get out of town. So they get out of town, and they go about 40 miles to a place called Berea. That's where we pick up the story here in Acts chapter 17, verse 10. The brothers immediately, so, you know, they've been kicked out of Philippi, now they've been kicked out of Thessalonica, they find themselves in Berea. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Again, this is Paul's pattern. We saw this in Thessalonica. He goes to the Jewish people in the synagogue. Why? Because they have the Old Testament law. The Old Testament uh, scriptures were prepared people for Christ. And so they're strategic. They go first to the Jews, and then they'll teach anybody who will follow, who who will listen. That's the pattern here in Berea. That'll be the pattern when Paul goes to Athens. We'll see next. He's very strategic. Verse 11 says, Now, these people were more, these Bereans were more noble minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number, a significant number of prominent Greek women and men. We'll get back to that line, maybe you want to underline it, more noble-minded in a moment. But I want to make sure we don't miss one thing that Luke does here, that Luke is writing this, this, that's really, I think, profound. Not only does he mention Greek women, but he mentions them before the men. Remember the Jewish boys were taught when they were in synagogue, they were taught a prayer that included saying, God, thank you that you have not created me a slave, a woman, or a foreigner. These Greek women are two out of three. They are Greek and they are women. And yet, Luke not only, again, points out (laughs) the Greek women, but he puts them even, mentions them even before the men. He has mentioned women before in, 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 uh, in Philippi, for instance. Luke here highlights, but so often people who don't understand the Bible or appreciate the context, the cultural context of the Bible, 
you get this idea, they'll try to make you believe that the Bible is anti-women. It is not. This is quite countercultural. It's a kind of a big deal. Verse 13. But when the Jews from Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and, churring, and stirring up the crowds. Berea is 45 miles from Thessalonica. Yet the angry mobs find out about Paul and they go there to stir up trouble as well. Angry mobs travel. Those of us who live in the Washington, D.C. area know this is true. One of the things you learn real fast here is when there are protests, usually you have the same protesters. They're just protesting different things. It's like there are professional protesters who just kind of come to the, the D.C. area, whatever it is that's going to protest. They're going to show up to, to they're the protest crowd. Well, that's kind of the same in those days. There's this protest crowd. That's, they're willing to travel 45 miles on foot or whatever they were, you know, uh, riding to give trouble for Paul and Silas and Timothy, verse 14. Then immediately the brothers sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. So the same pattern, um, Paul and Silas and Timothy preach Jesus in the synagogue and then to anybody else who will listen in Berea. Some believe, some don't. Those who don't believe persecute those who do believe. And they apparently got word to those in Thessalonica that said, hey, let's join together and persecute those who don't, who, who do believe. So those who don't believe persecute those who do believe. And Paul and Silas and, uh, and, and Paul at this point, they say, Paul, why don't you get out of town? Apparently Paul is the one that they, they really want to get rid of. And Silas and Timothy stay behind a little bit longer to do, to, to do the finish up work. Paul goes 300 miles to Athens. We're going to pick up the story there next time. But I love that great commendation. It says the Bereans were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. The Christians in Thessalonica, the believers were good people, but the Bereans were more noble, were more noble-minded. Why are they so praiseworthy? Two quick applications. First of all, because they were teachable. They were more teachable. Verse 11 says... They were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians, those in Thessalonica, for they received the word of God with eagerness. That's the picture of teachability. They received the word of God. They were ready to listen. You know, some people in the synagogue didn't receive Paul's teaching. Maybe they were open to other things, but just not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe they thought they knew it all and they didn't have anything to learn from Paul. Maybe they just assumed that Paul was teaching something that they'd heard before and weren't interested. It's kind of like today. Some people are just slaves of prejudice against the gospel. They'll be ready to receive teaching that's false teaching from schools or false teaching from philosophy or false teaching from news or false teaching from college professors or false teaching from non-Christian family members or false teaching from peers that clog their ears. But when it comes to the Bible, they just aren't open. They're not ready to receive. For others, I think pride makes them skeptical. They don't receive because they feel kind of smug about being uncommitted toward new truth or anything that they already believe. Or quite frankly, there are some people that just kind of like their skepticism. And no amount of truth is going to persuade them because they feel kind of superior to be able to poke holes in everything. Again, it's really easy to, to tear down. It takes some courage and effort to actually build up. There's a whole bunch of deconstructing that's going on in our world today. And um, Craig Edmonds made a really good observation. He said, with engineers, you deconstruct so you can reconstruct, so you can understand. But today there are people that just love to deconstruct, but it's not for any constructive purpose. It's just because they enjoy 
the superiority, I think, of feeling like they can deconstruct something. But the Bereans are praised because they received the word with great eagerness. They were hungry to be taught. They were teachable. They weren't naive. They were teachable. See, and we know they weren't naive because they were active as they learned. They didn't just accept it naively. They were active investigators. Verse 11 continues, they were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see what the, to see whether these things were so. In other words, there are two extremes to be avoided. The one extreme is skepticism, where you're always doubting, always deconstructing, never believing. But the other extreme is credulity, ignoring your doubts, never asking serious questions or tough questions. They examined the scriptures, even though that must have been difficult for them. Remember, this is a few years, like 900, before the inventing of the printing press. It's not like they had a bunch of worn out Bibles in their houses. If they're going to examine the scripture, they had to go to the synagogue. Or they had to, maybe there were some of the new scriptures, the New Testament scriptures that were beginning to circulate. We know by this time the Gospels of Mark and Matthew were written. The Gospel of, or the the Gospel, the, the letter of James has been written. Don't know if it's been received there or not. Some speculate that maybe the letter of Galatians has been written and would have arrived in that area. Probably not. My point is, even though it was really difficult for them, they were so noble because they studied the scripture. They they had their they heard what Paul said and then made sure that what he said lined up with the rest of inspired scripture that was at their disposal. I think one of the greatest blessings of my life is the number of Berean type people that God has given me as examples to follow. I grew up in a church filled with Berean type people who valued personal Bible study. I grew up in a church that encouraged us as children in Bible school or church camp to memorize the Bible and to learn Bible stories. Sunday school was a big deal when I was growing up. We studied the Bible together. We learned a lot about the Bible together. Uh, Not unlike small groups today, but still a little bit different. My parents and grandparents studied the Bible on their own. I remember riding in the car with my grandparents after one semester in college. I think I just um, finished an Old Testament history class. And I was really excited to talk to them about what I'd learned about the Egyptians and the Hittites and the Babylonians and the Assyrians and um, the Persians. And sure enough, if my grandparents didn't know everything that I was talking about, including, you know, oh yeah, Tiglath Pileser, you know, it's like, oh yeah, so you know, um, 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 you know, Sargon, or I was like, wait a second, you didn't even go to college and you know these things. But these people were like Bereans. They studied the Bible on their own because they were hungry to know the Lord. If you want to have a strong faith, be noble-minded like the Bereans. You know, there was a study that was done by Willow Creek Community Church probably about 15 years ago now. It's called the Reveal Study. And one of the things they discovered in this church, it was a seeker-driven church, and I think that was part of the problem, but they said what they discovered was the longer people were members at that church, the less satisfied they were. The longer they were members of that church, the more likely they were to want to go to a different church. The more likely they just felt like they weren't being fed well. Now, I think part of that's part of the weakness of the seeker-driven church is when you're focused on people that don't know Christ or the infants that don't know Christ, then the longer people are away from infancy, the less fed they're going to 
feel the whatever, but I think that's part of the problem. But one of the things that the Reveal Society discovered, I think, is absolutely true. They said that if there's one key for people being deeply satisfied, for people growing spiritually, the one key was studying the Bible on their own daily. They said if they found that if the people who would read the Bible and study the Bible on their own, to discover God on their own, people who could feed themselves, were the most satisfied followers of Christ in that congregation. And I think that's true. I think that's always true. I had a friend that told me years ago, Brett, if you don't teach the people in your church to study the Bible on their own, eventually they'll feel hungry and they'll blame it on you. They'll feel spiritually hungry and they'll think it's because you're not feeding them well. And while that may be true, the reality is if we don't learn to feed ourselves, then we are going to feel spiritually depleted. So if you want to grow, be like the Bereans, be teachable, eager to receive the word of God, not gullible, but eager to learn, eager to receive it, not just be skeptical and doubt it, but then be an active investigator studying the Bible on your own. 2 Corinthians 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a worker who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Heavenly Father, would you make us a group of people like the Brians, noble-minded, noble thinking, because we are hungry for your word. We're hungry to learn from you. And we're constantly investigating. We're constantly feeding on your word to draw closer to you. Not because your word is divine because you use it to communicate your heart to us. I pray these things through Christ. Amen. Hey, if you're not connected to a small group, one of the best ways for you to grow spiritually is to connect with a small group. So if you want to do that, uh, you don't know how, please just contact us at the church and we'll let you know how. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're part of New Life and you're part of a group, who do you need to invite to your group? That's the better way to do it. Rather than doing it organizationally through the church, for you, just invite your friends to join you. Because when a friend invites a friend, they're so much more apt to learn together. Thanks for joining me. Hope to see you soon.